Good afternoon and welcome to the OCR update on HIPAA and COVID-19 webinar. A few housekeeping items. You may submit questions in the Q&A box. We will be um, answering as many questions as possible throughout the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online shortly. This afternoon, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Timothy Noonan who is the Deputy Director for Health Information Privacy at the Office of Civil Rights here at the Department of Health and Human Services. Also joining us as a panelist this afternoon is Marisa gordon Wynn, who is the Senior Advisor for Health Information Privacy Policy in the Office of Civil Rights at HHS. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Timothy. Great. Hello, everyone. This is Tim Noonan. I'd like to thank ONC for hosting this webinar and inviting OCR to speak and the work that they have done to bring us all together here today. And I also want to thank you uh, for finding time in your busy schedules to join us on today's discussion. Uh, the pressing demands on everyone's time in the healthcare space right now is pretty intense, and so I appreciate everyone finding some time in their schedule to be here too. We uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to share an update on some of our recent work in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency, explain why we issued certain documents or undertook certain actions, and to answer some of the questions that we've received. This is my third webinar on COVID-19, and uh, the speed and convenience of doing a webinar is, is really great in being able to reach a, a large number of people and, and there isn't the burden of making travel arrangements. Uh, however, I do, do miss the live interaction with an audience as it uh, helps in understanding when I'm really connecting on a point or when I need to offer more explanation on something I might have muddled. Uh, I also miss talking to the folks uh, individually after speaking. Uh, so often uh, the questions or stories that we hear at uh, conferences or presentations guide our thinking on future rulemaking or, or, or guidance. So we'll try to answer some questions throughout the presentation today, and we'll provide some contact information at the end if you want to send any questions to OCR. We're not able to answer every question individually, but we do read every question we receive, and it really does help us in all of our guidance and rulemaking efforts. Uh, Marisa gordon Wynn, OCR's Head of Health Information Privacy Policy, is going to start us off with a discussion on the February Bulletin on HIPAA and COVID-19 and then we'll alternate on the materials that you see here on the slide. Thanks. Marisa? Thanks, Tim. All right, next slide. Hi, everybody. OCR issued this bulletin early on in the public health emergency, and we had a couple of goals. One was a key message that we wanted to emphasize, that the HIPAA privacy rule is balanced and flexible. It doesn't prevent all information sharing, even though for a lot of people, that is the first thing that they think of when they think of HIPAA. But in fact, it, it protects privacy and it permits beneficial information sharing. So for example, emergency situations and public health activities are considerations that are built into the rule. So the bulk of the bulletin provides an important reminder about existing HIPAA permissions that allow covered entities and business associates to share individuals protected health information or PHI to protect the health of individuals and the public. And it also highlights entities ongoing obligations to protect the privacy and security of PHI. And we work very hard in OCR and spent a lot of time trying to help people understand these values work together and they're not in conflict. But the privacy rule permits many types of uses and disclosures of PHI without individual's authorization. These permissions are always available, including during an emergency situation like a hurricane or wildfire or an outbreak of infectious disease. So first and foremost, of course, the rule permits uses and disclosures of PHI for treatment. It also permits them for public health activities. So for example, to a public health authority like the CDC or a state or local health department, 
And the bulletin includes an example of reporting PHI to CDC on an ongoing basis. And part of the purpose of this example, and one of the reasons that we are including a lot of examples throughout our guidance and in the notifications of enforcement discretion is to help illustrate issues that come up among you know covered entities and individuals and so this one for example the cdc example of ongoing reporting is to illustrate that a covered entity can continue reporting over time without the need for the cdc to keep making the same request every day or every week if cdc says you know we need you to report um, on this schedule for example and disclosures are permitted to persons at risk of contracting or spreading a disease if the notification is authorized by other law. We'll dive more deeply into that permission later on in the webinar. And the, there's also a permission to use and disclose PHI to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to a person or the public. And that, again, we will look at more closely later on. So that first set of examples I just walked through, they don't require an authorization or any kind of affirmative agreement from the individual. The privacy rule also permits certain uses and disclosures without individual's authorization when the individual hasn't objected. So for these uses and disclosures, the entity is supposed to provide the opportunity to agree or object or if they aren't able to do that because they're incapacitated or there's an emergency circumstance, the covered entity can use its judgment about the individual's best interest. So for example, a covered entity can share PHI with a family member, friend, or others involved in a patient's care or to notify someone uh, about the condition of the patient or to provide very basic, what we call facility directory information in response to a specific inquiry for a patient by name. So these are the permissions that allow a covered entity to tell a patient's spouse about their diagnosis and treatment and they'll allow a covered entity to look up a patient's adult child's contact information and notify them that their elderly parent is in critical condition. Or to tell a patient's neighbor who calls the hospital to find out if Jane Smith is there because she hasn't been seen in a few days, that yes, she's there and she's alive. As I mentioned, the bulletin also provides reminders about privacy protections. And one of these is that except for treatment disclosures, a covered entity generally has to make reasonable efforts to limit the PHI used or disclosed to the minimum necessary to accomplish the purpose. And this minimum necessary standard is a core privacy principle, longstanding, even before the HIPAA privacy rule came into being, that you don't access or share or mess with more of an individual's identifiable information than you need. And this principle is also referred to as role-based access, especially in the information security context. But recognizing that a covered entity may not always be in the best position to determine what's the minimum necessary PHI for a particular purpose, and to avoid creating delays and in information sharing that is going to benefit individuals and the public, the privacy rule also builds in the ability to rely on certain public officials when they say that they need information. Uh, so under the privacy rule, a covered entity can rely on representations from a public health authority or another public official that the information they're asking for is the minimum necessary for a public health purpose when the reliance is reasonable under the circumstances. And so if a public health authority like CDC tells you it needs all lab test results for people who are suspected to have been exposed to and they've been tested for 
the novel coronavirus, you can rely on that. They are the experts and they are the authority that has the responsibility to protect the public's health. And the covered entity doesn't have to, it is not expected to substitute its judgment for the public health authority to try to determine what's really necessary for the CDC or for their state health departments doing similar work to do that important work. Another important reminder in the bulletin is that in general, disclosures to the media or the public at large of information about the treatment of an identifiable individual are not allowed without the individual's written authorization. There are very, very limited exceptions, like if a disclosure is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat, or when it's necessary to locate and notify a family member about an incapacitated patient's condition. And those permissions have very specific conditions around them to make sure that they're limited. In the COVID-19 context, and because we've seen videos on the news of patients in emergency departments, for example, we want to keep emphasizing that the restrictions in the privacy rule on public disclosures, including media access to PHI, aren't thrown out the window because we're in this emergency and it's a very strange time for all of us. So, of course, the news media and the public want to see what's going on inside a hospital. But the individuals being treated there have a right to privacy and that includes the right to decide whether their PHI ends up on TV. There are consequences to patients and their family members of that kind of exposure. And this can be stigma related to having a disease. It could be potentially becoming a target for scams related to COVID-19. And those are just a couple of examples. Finally, Covered entities must continue to implement reasonable safeguards to protect PHI against impermissible uses and disclosures. And we're going to talk about reasonable safeguards and examples of those throughout the webinar, but for now, I'd point out that the standard of reasonableness is inherently situational. And what I mean by that in this context is that a covered entity can and should take into account the effects of the outbreak on its operations and on the public that it serves in determining what safeguards are reasonable in the circumstances. I'm almost done with this piece, but before moving on, I want to emphasize that all of the points in this bulletin remain true and in effect. But as you know, COVID-19 is creating some uniquely challenging circumstances. And, and this has led OCR to take additional steps to help address the emergency. And that's what we're going to get into now. So, so back to you, Tim. Okay, great, thanks. Next slide. So on March 17th, uh, OCR issued the first notification of enforcement discretion, and this was on telehealth remote communications. Uh, OCR was part of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services action to support telehealth to limit the risk of COVID-19 infection for patients and other persons who could be exposed from in-person healthcare provider visits. Uh, CMS expanded Medicare coverage for tele telehealth visits, uh, OCR, we announced we would not impose HIPAA penalties uh, for the good faith use of telehealth during the emergency. And uh, the AHHS Office of Inspector General also provided flexibility for healthcare providers to reduce or waive benefic beneficiary cost sharing for telehealth visits paid by federal healthcare programs. All of these actions were designed to allow the use of everyday technologies to facilitate greater access to healthcare through telehealth services. So what are the takeaways from OCR's notification. Uh, first, it applies to telehealth for any reason. So regardless of whether the telehealth service is related to the diagnosis uh, or treatment of health conditions related to COVID-19, uh, the notification covers it. So somebody could receive telehealth for a sprained ankle, uh, 
uh, dental consultation, uh, psychological evaluation, uh, it does not have to be related to COVID-19. Uh, the patient doesn't have to have a cough or a temperature or any symptoms for our exercise of enforcement discretion to apply. We, we wanted to encourage uh, the use of telehealth without uh, the undue fear of um, HIPAA penalties. Now, in doing so, you know, why did we go so broad? And it was the recognition there could be instances where an individual would want uh, telehealth because someone they live with could have a compromised immune system and they don't want to risk exposing that person uh, to illness. So the notification applies to telehealth for any reason. Next main point, uh, healthcare providers can use non-public facing audio or video communication products. Now the HIPAA rules normally requires a business associate agreement when another entity uh, creates, receives, maintains, or transmits electronic protected health information uh, on behalf of a covered entity. And the business associate agreement uh, sets the limits on the uses or disclosures of protected health information uh, by the business associate and provides the assurances that the business associate will safeguard uh, the information. This public health emergency presented an emergency circumstance where those here felt the need to facilitate access to health care uh, while implementing social distancing and wanting to protect those who could be most readily affected caused us to take this action. And so what this notification did was allow covered health care providers to use common communication technologies, even if there is no business associate agreement uh, in, in place between the covered health care provider and the communication vendor without the risk of a HIPAA penalty. So during this public health emergency, some of the everyday communication apps that can be used to facilitate telehealth include Apple FaceTime, Facebook uh, Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts video, uh, Zoom or Skype, to, to name a few. We encourage providers to notify their patients that these third-party apps potentially introduce privacy risks and healthcare providers should enable all of the available encryption and privacy modes uh, when using such apps. Uh, now, very important point, this notification does not apply uh, to the use of public facing apps such as Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, and these should not be used by covered healthcare providers in the provision of telehealth. Non-public facing apps uh, as a default allow only uh, the intended parties to participate uh, in a communication, and they are generally not open to the public. Uh, public facing apps don't have those limitations, and that's why they're, they're not appropriate, and our, our notification and subsequent guidance uh, expound upon that. Finally, uh, in the interest of uh, providing information uh, to the regulated community, we identified some uh, communication products that represent they will sign uh, a business uh, associate agreement and represent that they are HIPAA compliant, such as uh, Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, Updocs, Zoom for Healthcare, Amazon Chime, uh, GoToMeeting. This is not an endorsement. OCR has not reviewed the business associate agreements offered by these vendors or the state of their uh, uh, compliance uh, with HIPAA. Uh, instead, just recognizing that uh, these products are out there and recognizing the, the, the speed with which uh, healthcare providers uh, were moving, uh, trying to uh, implement telehealth, uh, we wanted to identify some vendors that at least represent that uh, they are HIPAA compliant and will sign a business associate agreement. Uh, our director, uh, when we issued the notification, I think put it best that uh, we're empowering medical providers to serve patients wherever they are, including in their homes, during this national public health emergency. And we are the Office for Civil Rights. In addition to our health information privacy interests, uh, we also enfor uh, enforce the, the civil rights laws uh, under our jurisdiction. And we are especially concerned about reaching those most at risk, including older persons and persons with disabilities. So telehealth is a, is a great tool uh, to reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19. And OCR was excited to be able to assist in furthering this. So let's see if we can answer some questions here related to telehealth. Are the security rule regulations suspended for telemedicine visits? So uh, 
the starting point, the HIPAA rules are not suspended. Uh, OCR's notification of enforcement discretion states OCR will not impose penalties for violations of the HIPAA rules in connection with the good faith provision of telehealth during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Our notification applies to all of the HIPAA rules, uh, privacy, security, breach notification. Our it's limited to good faith provision of telehealth during this public health emergency. So uh, the short answer is uh, the security rule is not suspended, but, but, but OCR will not be imposing a penalty for HIPAA security rule violations that occur in the good faith provision of telehealth. Let's see, another question. Can telephone calls be substituted for patients who cannot use video chat? So uh, the question is whether our notification uh, in, includes the use of a telephone to provide telehealth. Uh, yes, audio communication products can be used to provide telehealth and would be covered by our uh, exercise of enforcement discretion. Let's see. Um, can a quarantined physician perform telemedicine from home or their area of quarantine? So first, uh, let me say I, I do uh, appreciate the willingness of a physician who's quarantined to want to continue to serve the public by offering to provide telehealth services. It seems in every crisis there are uh, stories of selfless acts that occur that, that reflect our, our good nature and spirit. Um, to that end, a physician that is quarantined could provide telehealth services consistent with our notification and not be subject to a HIPAA penalty. Our guidance supporting the notification stated our expectation that healthcare providers would ordinarily conduct telehealth in private settings, and we recommended some reasonable safeguards uh, for instances when it cannot be performed in a private setting. But uh, to answer the question, yes, a, a physician could do it uh, from their home uh, or area of qu quarantine. Let's see, uh, maybe one more question. Um, can alternative means of communication be used when patients do not have telehealth capabilities, such as texting or email? Yes. Uh, again, we will not impose a penalty for the good faith provision of telehealth. Uh, our guidance provided examples of non-public facing texting apps uh, that can be used to provide telehealth, and similarly, email could be used. Uh, we would encourage the continued efforts to safeguard and protect patient privacy and would recommend encrypting email transmissions. But uh, since I appear to be previewing our telehealth guidance, why don't we move on to that? Marisa? Yes, I've been crossing out items as you speak to them. So the FAQs reinforce and provide more detail on the who, the what, when, where, why, and how of the notification. And like many of OCR's FAQs, which are numerous and searchable by key terms, as many of you probably know, they address particular situations that the public and regulated entities have told us create some uncertainty for them or challenges in implementation. So the first question we put forward in the FAQ is a baseline one. You know, what do we consider telehealth to encompass? What does it mean? And the FAQ sets out a fairly broad definition that covers a range of activities from clinical care to public health. And as to mention, because we had already received a question about whether the enforcement discretion covered telephone or audio only communications because I'm sure because the notification and the examples have really focused primarily on video chat apps that in this first FAQ where we say, you know, this is what we think of as telehealth, we specifically cite technologies that can be used for telehealth that are range from video conferencing to wireless communications to landline communications. And those, the listed items in this FAQ are not exclusive. These are just examples to show the breadth of the tools that can be used. And so where can providers conduct telehealth 
This might seem a funny question, given that we're saying we're not going to be imposing penalties in relation to the good faith provision of telehealth, but we're still in a powerful position really to encourage good practices. And so in addition to, as Tim you know, mentioned, the being able to perform telehealth in you know, different settings like uh, someone's home, um, we took the opportunity at, during, in this FAQ to say that telehealth should be in a private setting with reasonable protect, precautions to protect privacy and simple actions like closing an office door and lowering voices can minimize unauthorized disclosures. And next, because as Tim mentioned earlier, CMS also issued announcements about telehealth at the same time that OCR issued our telehealth notification. We received questions about whether the enforcement discretion was tied to Medicare payments or only applied when a provider was serving Medicare or Medicaid patients. And so we took the opportunity to clarify in an FAQ that there is no such limitation related to any type of insurance coverage or a lack of insurance coverage. We had also received a question about whether the security rule was included in the enforcement discretion or if it was only the privacy rule. So we thought, okay, apparently it was not enough to say all of the rules in the enforcement discretion. Let's make sure we say it even more strongly and even more uh, in a specific FAQ that this covers the HIPAA privacy, security, and breach notification rules. The limitation is that the enforcement discretion only applies where the noncompliance is related to the good faith provision of telehealth. And consistent with this scope, we also said OCR would not impose penalties if a provider experiences a breach of PHI in the good faith provision of telehealth even if it's caused by failures to fully comply with the requirements of the security rule. We also heard questions about whether the enforcement discretion applies to the regulation that protects the confidentiality of substance use disorder treatment records. Called, these are called part two records. And we answered no, this is just HIPAA, but because there is overlap in jurisdiction and requirements uh, between HIPAA covered entities and part two entities, although they're not exactly um, coterminous, we, uh, um, we pointed folks to specific guidance from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA on flexibilities under their part two authorities during the public health emergency. Because we recognize that when people think of health information privacy, they think HIPAA. And so they're gonna come to us and including by asking us questions that might be under the purview of someone else. So we wanna make sure that folks have the tools that they need, have access to the information they need to understand requirements that apply to them during the public health emergency. We said, as Tim mentioned, that a non-public facing remote communication product, so the good kind, <laughs> is one that as a default allows only the intended parties to participate in the communication. And we point out some privacy and security capabilities to look for in, a, in products that are widely available, like end-to-end -end encryption, individual user accounts, logins, and passcodes to limit access to the communication. We also say that using public-facing remote communication products, so the bad kind, could be evidence of bad faith in the provision of telehealth, which would move a healthcare provider outside of the protection of the enforcement discretion. And we pro provide additional examples of what's potentially bad faith, like criminal acts, 
like the sale of PHI and like violating professional ethical standards. This FAQ allowed us to put some meat on the bones of the condition expressed in the notification that noncompliance has to be in connection with the good faith provision of telehealth. Okay, so let's see, we'll have a couple of questions. One is, I can answer two at once, I think, here. So if a provider asks a patient to email a picture of an injury or a rash, and the patient does so through unencrypted email, is this covered by the enforcement discretion? And then another one is, what if a healthcare provider uses a scanning app on their smartphone to upload patient records into an electronic health record? And the answers are yes, and yes, these are covered. It is, of course, uh, ideal to be able to use encrypted communications and to uh, implement, you know, the most uh, protective safeguards possible, but this notification of enforcement discretion means that nobody is going to face consequences for errors or the inability to implement the, these sort of strict, uh, reasonable safeguards when they're in uh, providing telehealth in good faith. All right, another question is, does the enforcement discretion apply to online counseling sessions for domestic violence groups or other types of group counseling? So the answer here is yes. So provided that the provider is covered by HIPAA, they, this would fall into the notification. And uh, so a provider can conduct group counseling sessions through remote communications technologies in the same way that they would to one particular individual for providing treatment. And just like with other remote communications for telehealth, you know, they should be using non-public facing remote communications products and continue to apply reasonable safeguards for privacy. All right, now back to Tim for first responders. Okay, thanks. So we uh, have been tracking media stories as well as email to OCR to identify areas where questions were arising or where greater clarification was needed. One of the areas we noticed was the need for clarification on disclosures of protected health information to law enforcement, uh, paramedics, other first responders, and public health authorities. We, we rely so much on our first responders who put themselves at risk on a daily basis under normal circumstances, and during a public health emergency, it's, it's important that we do everything we can to help those who protect us and help us in our time of need. We issued this guidance on March 24th to address the permissible disclosures by a covered entity uh, about an individual who's been infected or exposed to COVID-19 uh, with law enforcement, paramedics, uh, et cetera, without an individual's authorization. And so you'll see some of the same permissions that uh, are in our February bulletin that uh, Marisa previewed earlier, such as treatment, uh, public health activities, uh, serious and imminent uh, threat. But we added more examples to help clarify how the permissions can be used during the current public health emergency. Uh, many of these examples were drawn from questions to OCR or what we had seen or read in the media. And you'll also note that in some of these examples, more than one HIPAA permission could be applicable. So some highlights, uh, when the disclosure is needed for treatment, uh, PHI can always be disclosed for treatment and the minimum necessary standard uh, doesn't apply. Uh, when uh, notification is required by law. So what does required by law mean? It's uh, federal, state, local, or other law enforceable in court. And so for example, HIPAA permits a covered entity such as a hospital to disclose protected health information about an individual who tests positive for COVID-19 in accordance with the state law. 
that requires the reporting of confirmed or suspected cases of infectious disease to public health officials. Uh, I think the big takeaway is HIPAA is not a barrier uh, to disclosing information. If, if there's a state law, local law, uh, or other law enforceable in court that requires a reporting, HIPAA has a permission built in to allow, uh, allow that to take place. Another permission that uh, perhaps hasn't been discussed uh, as often in the past is the permission to notify a public health authority in order to prevent or control the spread of disease. So for example, HIPAA permits a car density to disclose protected health information to a public health authority like the CDC or a state and local uh, public health department. And in turn, if a card entity receives a request uh, for protected health information uh, from a, a public authority, the card entity can rely upon the representation that the information requested is the minimum necessary. Another area, uh, very important, when, when first responders may be at risk of infection. So again, HIPAA permits a, a covered county health department, for example, uh, in accordance with state law to disclose protected health information to a police officer or another person who may come into contact with the person who tested positive for COVID-19 for purposes of preventing or spreading uh, the disease. Uh, I think everyone's probably familiar generally with our uh, to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health and safety of a person or the public. And so this is uh, very broad. It allows uh, a disclosure uh, by a card entity consistent with applicable law and standards of ethical conduct uh, about individuals who tested positive for COVID-19. And this can be to fire department personnel, child welfare workers, mental health crisis service, services personnel, or others charged with protecting the health or safety uh, of the public. And this permission has uh, a good faith component uh, built into it. If the covered entity believes in good faith that the disclosure of the information is necessary uh, to prevent or minimize the threat, uh, they have a, a permission to, to make that disclosure. Now, what I'd like to highlight is some steps that OCR has taken um, that we've never done before. And this is uh, recognizing uh, the unprecedented nature of this uh, public health emergency and uh, the concerns uh, for uh, first responders. We, uh, for the first time, talked about providing a list of individuals. Uh, and we tried to do it in a balanced way so that uh, information can flow uh, to a first responder that's reporting and that they can take uh, necessary precautions while still trying to maintain some privacy protections. So a covered entity such as the hospital may provide a list of the names and addresses of all the individuals it knows to have tested positive or received treatment for COVID-19 to an EMS dispatch. And now the EMS dispatch then would be able to use the information on that list on a per call basis to inform EMS personnel who are responding on a particular call. Uh, so that, again, they can take extra precautions or, or use personal protective equipment. Uh, a card entity should not post the contents of such a list publicly, such as on a website or through distribution to the media. Uh, the list shouldn't be distributed uh, to EMS personnel, uh, but instead it can be used on a per call basis so that uh, when responding uh, to a particular location, uh, the EMS personnel are in a position to know whether or not they need uh, personal protective uh, equipment. And We've already seen some media stories about uh, since we've issued the guidance, uh, these actions being taken. So it's, it's uh, gratifying uh, to know that uh, the guidance we've issued is starting to have some effect and our, our first responders uh, can get that necessary information. Uh, another step that we took uh, that we hadn't done before was uh, referencing a, a 9-11 call center and they can ask screening questions of all callers. For example, their temperature or whether they have a cough or difficulty breathing or other uh, potential symptomology uh, for potential cases of COVID-19. And call center is permitted to inform a police officer being dispatched to the scene, uh, much like we just spoke about with the EMS personnel, uh, name, address, and screen results so that uh, police officers could 
take uh, extra precautions or use personal protective equipment to lessen their risk of exposure. Uh, this guidance also included a reminder about the minimum necessary standard that except when required uh, by law or for treatment disclosures, a covered entity must make reasonable efforts to limit the information used or disclosed. And uh, also a reminder, uh, covered entities should consult other applicable laws, uh, state, uh, local statutes, regulation in their jurisdiction uh, prior to using or making disclosures of protected information as such laws may, may place further restrictions on HIPAA uh, beyond what HIPAA uh, does. So let's see if we have a question. What recourse uh, does a fire department have to obtain information on positive COVID-19 cases, address information, uh, from the hospital or public health department? Is OCR's guidance only a suggestion? And both covered entities do not have any obligation to share this information with us. The HIPAA privacy rule is a, has a permissive-based regulatory structure. There are only a couple of required disclosures within the rule uh, to an individual seeking their medical records or an accounting of disclosure, and to OCR when, when OCR is conducting a HIPAA investigation. The privacy rule is flexible. It has uh, many permissions, as, as we discussed today, that allow the use or disclosure of protected health information without an individual's authorization. Uh, these permissions, uh, like when required by law or to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat, are examples of uh, disclosures within HIPAA that can occur without an individual's authorization. However, because these are just permissions, a covered entity may uh, but is not required to uh, share protected health information, including COVID-19 information uh, under HIPAA. So to answer the question, while HIPAA does not require a covered entity to share this information uh, with a fire department, there may be a state or local law which requires that this type of information be given to the fire uh, department or uh, other first responders for that matter. And our guidance makes clear that HIPAA is not a barrier to the sharing of this information uh, with law enforcement and first responders. And in fact, there's a number of permissions that allow that information to be shared. Okay, Risa. All right, I am back to talk about the notification of enforcement discretion for business associate uses and disclosures for public health and health oversight, which is a mouthful. First, some background to set this up. The HIPAA privacy rule permits a covered entity to use and disclose PHI for public health and health oversight purposes. The rule permits a business associate to do the same thing only if its business associate agreement or BAA with the covered entity says that it can. So if the BAA is silent on the matter, the business associate can't do that user disclosure. So in this way, the covered entity retains control over uses and disclosures of its PHI that the, P, that the BA, the business associate holds for it. OCR was aware that some business associates really have vast stores of PHI. And in some cases, they might be in a better position to share or perform data analytics on the PHI at the request of a public health authority or health oversight agency to help that authority or agency protect the health and safety of the public during the emergency. Now, under normal circumstances, the business associate and covered entity would need to renegotiate the BAA if it didn't already allow those uses and disclosures by the business associate. But some of these business associates have contractual relationships with hundreds or even thousands of covered entities, which would make it extremely time intensive, if not impossible, to modify all of their BAAs to expressly permit them to conduct these activities that covered entities already can do with their own PHI. So with all of this as the backdrop, OCR issued this 
notification of enforcement discretion so that business associates can make these beneficial uses and disclosures of PHI, the PHI of the covered entities, without modifying all of their BAAs during the period of this public health emergency. Of course, conditions apply. So the enforcement discretion covers good faith uses and disclosures that are consistent with the permissions and conditions in the privacy rule for these disclosures that apply to covered entities. And the business associate must inform the covered entity within 10 calendar days after the use or disclosure. Or if it's going to be repeated or ongoing after the use or disclosure begins. And there are some limitations. So unlike the telehealth enforcement discretion, which applies to all of the HIPAA rules to the extent the covered provider is engaged in telehealth in good faith, this enforcement discretion only applies to non-compliance with specific provisions of the privacy rule. And they're the ones that limit business associates uses and disclosures to what is in their BAA that require the BAA to document all permitted and required uses and disclosures, and that require covered entity to take steps to address a business associate's material breach or violation of the terms of a BAA. So in other words, while we're saying that a business associate can do this use or disclosure, even if it's contrary to what is in their existing BAA, we're saying we're not going to take enforcement action against a covered entity that fails to stop its business associate from doing this use or disclosure because we are, it's, it's something that we are allowing to happen. Um, and all other provisions of the privacy rule as well as the security and breach notification rules continue to apply. So let's see, maybe one question because we're, we're coming, up on, coming up on the end. Okay, so what form of notification to the covered entity is acceptable in the 10 day period? The notification, as you may have noticed, doesn't specify a method, but the business associate should make sure that there is some form of documentation so it can show that it did the required notification if any questions arise later. So, but as to, as to the form, OCR would recognize a variety of methods, and including, say, an email. All right, now the last handoff to Tim. All right, uh, OCR's most recent notification of enforcement discretion involved uh, COVID-19 community-based testing sites, and we did that on April 9th. Uh, OCR stated we would not impose penalties for violations of the HIPAA rules against covered healthcare providers or their business associates in connection with the good faith participation in the operation of a COVID-19 community-based testing site during this nationwide public health emergency. Uh, this notification had a retroactive effect uh, going back to March 13th, and it will remain in effect until the Secretary of HHS declares that the public health emergency no longer exists, or upon the exp expiration date of the declared public health emergency, including extensions, whichever occurs first. So, what does this mean? The, the idea here is that we're, we're seeing these COVID-19 specimen collection or testing sites pop up as mobile uh, drive-through or walk-up sites, uh, often in a parking lot. And OCR recognizes uh, the value these testing sites provide in being able to increase the number of people who can be tested so they know whether they're COVID-19 positive and can seek treatment and precautionary measures for themselves and the people around them. Uh, OCR also recognizes the challenges in trying to maintain compliance with the HIPAA rules while performing these services uh, in a parking lot, as opposed to inside an examination room in a doctor's office. So this notification applies uh, to all HIPAA card uh, 
healthcare providers and their business associates when they are in uh, acting in good faith in participating in the operation of one of these testing sites. This means that all of the activities that support the collection of specimens uh, from individuals for COVID-19 testing. Uh, this exercise of enforcement discretion does not apply to health plans uh, or healthcare uh, clearinghouse uh, and, and their functions, and it does not apply to current healthcare providers or their business associates when they are performing non uh, COVID-19 tested related activities, uh, including the handling of protected health information outside the operation of a testing site. So we, we provided some examples showing instances where HIPAA penalties could still apply uh, for activities that are unrelated to uh, a COVID-19 community-based testing site. Was, so we said a pharmacy that's per participating in the operation of a testing site in the parking lot, uh, but still has a retail facility could be subject uh, to a penalty for HIPAA violations that incur inside the retail facility that are unrelated to the operation of the testing site. So uh, drilling down a little bit further, for example, let's say the uh, pharmacy's retail facility was cleaning out a file room and took a bunch of um, patient records and put them in a dumpster out back. That activity uh, leaving uh, protected health information unsecured in a dumpster uh, could still be subject uh, to a potential HIPAA penalty. Uh, another example is a covered health care provider who is participating in the operation of a testing site uh, experiences a breach in their electronic health record system, which could include uh, protected health information gathered from the operation of the testing site. Uh, that could still be subject to a HIPAA penalty. So again, uh, Maybe more specifically, suppose uh, a provider uh, moved patient electronic health records uh, to a server that has no access controls on it, uh, so it was um, publicly viewable over the internet. That that type of activity could still be subject to a penalty. We also identified some reasonable safeguards that card entities and their business associates are, are encouraged to implement. Uh, the setting up of uh, canopies or opaque barriers to provide some privacy, uh, maintaining some distance from the point of service, uh, establishing buffer zones to limit the public or the media's uh, ability to see uh, individuals while they're uh, being treated, and using secure technology to record and transmit uh, EPHI. So what's, what's the takeaway? Uh, OCR is supporting the growth of these COVID-19 specimen uh, collection and testing sites and will be not imposing penalties for HIPAA violations that occur in the operation of these sites. Let's see, I think we can do a question here. Um, oh, all right. How will the COVID-19 pandemic affect OCR's general compliance enforcement posture after the expiration of the emergency declaration? For example, new owners of provider entities may have been delayed in completing the transition or build out of IT infrastructure due to the pandemic, or training of staff or new employees working remotely may have been delayed. All right, and I, we've gotten a couple of questions uh, about uh, what happens after, so I think that's a good way to wrap up here. Uh, when the public health emergency ends, OCR uh, we'll announce the end of our exercise of enforcement discretion, and HIPAA-covered entities and business associates will need to comply with the applicable HIPAA rules. Now, OCR recognizes uh, this public health emergency uh, presented uh, and continues to present unique challenges for covered entities and their business associates, and we would consider that, along with all other facts and circumstances in any potential OCR investigation. Um, I would further note, uh, OCR exercises its enforcement discretion in every investigation that we conduct and the cases that we select as enforcement actions. So for example, in 2019, OCR received over 28,000 HIPAA complaints. Uh, we also received over 500 large breach reports. Those are the breaches affecting 500 or more individuals. So OCR has a large, large selection of cases to choose from and consider as enforcement actions. Uh, 
OCR resolves a great many of our investigations with technical assistance. We generally uh, pursue a corrective action plan and monetary settlement or a civil money penalty when an investigation finds evidence of systemic noncompliance with the HIPAA rules or egregious violations of individuals' privacy rights. So this public health emergency would be one of the factors uh, that OCR considers uh, when making enforcement decisions. Let's see, uh, next slide. I do wanna highlight, uh, we do have a new HIPAA and COVID-19 uh, webpage. Uh, all of our COVID-19 related materials issued by OCR are posted there. Uh, it's everything that we've discussed today, as well as future materials, uh, such as notifications of enforcement discretion, uh, guidance, and bulletins. Um, what is OCR doing next? What, what, are, what are we working on? That's uh, also a, a popular question. Uh, we're developing more guidance materials. We're, we're continue to review media stories, uh, the complaints that we receive, email on uh, additional areas to develop guidance. Uh, we'll go through the questions that were submitted today, which uh, looks like it's over 300 now, uh, and invite uh, people to send questions to us. We have used the questions received uh, to develop our guidance to notifications of enforcement discretion uh, previously. Next slide. So to that end, here are ways to connect with OCR uh, on our website, uh, how to join our privacy uh, and security listservs. Uh, we also uh, send out information via Twitter. And next slide. This is our OCR mailbox email address, which uh, as I say, we'll gather up the questions that were presented uh, today and uh, go through them. We do read every single question, but if you have uh, additional questions or new questions that uh, haven't already been sent, uh, you may send it to the OCR mailbox and uh, we, we check that every day and go through that. Uh, and that's uh, been very helpful to us in, in developing uh, the materials that we've issued thus far. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your, your time and patience and uh, stay healthy. Uh, Amanda. Thank you so much, um, both you, Tim and Marisa, for lending your expertise for this um, very informative update on HIPAA during COVID-19. Thank you all participants for joining us today. As a reminder, the materials from this presentation um, will be made available once they're processed through compliance. Um, if you'd like to join our listserv to receive notifications on when the materials are available. You may do that by signing up at the OCR um, listserv, which is at www.hhs.gov slash OCR slash list dash serve, or via the ONC website at www.healthit.gov. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.